All right, so thank you. Um, this task was initiated by Phil Zimmerman uh, in r and &E. I'm sure many of you know Phil. She is officially retired at this point, but uh, still actually very active and engaged in the CERT community. And Phil's impetus for this was really um, framed by the digital engineering strategy the department published in 2018, which we'll talk about here in a second. All right, so what is digital engineering? This is the fifth talk in this track on digital engineering, so I don't think we need to spend a huge amount of time on that. Uh, the main word I'll highlight here is really about transformation, and this is one of Phil's slides, so I won't take, take credit for that, but it's really about the transformation of the way that we have traditionally done not only systems engineering, but acquisition in the department to take advantage of um, the power of uh, doing things more digitally. And so one of the terms that actually David has gotten us to use is digitized versus digitalized. Digitized meaning, hey, I have a document, now it's a PDF. Ooh, it's digital, yay for us. <laughs> uh, digitalized meaning we actually have thoughtfully gone through and taken advantage of doing this in a digital way, changed our approach and process to make it more streamlined and effective. So uh, that's that's kind of the intent here. So who here has read the DE strategy the department published in 2018? Yeah. Okay, all right, I was gonna say a few more hands, I hope. Uh, so as you know, there are five main strategic goals uh, for the strategy, and we're just gonna run through them quickly for context. So the first one really being about, sorry, um, formalizing the use of models. And one, uh, one major part of that is how do we get authoritative data? So both yesterday and today, the theme of data has been very important. How do we make sure that we have uh, valid and verifiable data? And how do we actually make sure that uh, that is useful in supporting our models as well as our decision makers? So how do we actually utilize models across our environment? How do we, again, uh, look across the acquisition life cycle? So you think about the systems life cycle, we have models that can run across that. How do we use models across the entire acquisition life cycle? And again, how do we do this in a way that uses authoritative data to make sure that we are doing the right things and making the best decisions we can with the data that's available? Um, one of the goals uh, of the strategy is also that it'll actually enable us to use other technologies and incorporate technologies more quickly. So we've heard a lot already uh, in the last two days about things like AI, uh, machine learning, digital twins. The, the goal being that if we can move faster by using a more digital approach, then we can incorporate these types of things more quickly. We can improve the technologies and not wait 20 years for us to finish an ACAT-1 program. Um, and then the fourth goal of the strategy is about the uh, environment, and this is really the ecosystem. So we haven't talked a lot about this in the last two days, but underlying all of this is the idea that you have to have not only the data, but the tools and the software, the processes uh, and the approaches and the people who can pull all of this together in a meaningful way. And I love that they put people in the center because that is what the goal five is all about. It's about changing the culture and changing the workforce so that they can actually um, do digital engineering and enable transformation in an appropriate way. No, I think you've got it. Okay. All right. So what we were tasked with was to support that fifth goal of building a digital engineering competency framework. And I see Frank back there. Frank was heavily engaged in our work, so feel free to jump in at any point in time. Um, but really what we were trying to do is say, all right, if we're going to do this whole digital transformation thing, what are the critical skills, knowledge, skills, and abilities? What are the behaviors we need our workforce to be able to accomplish in order to get there? So our main approach was we were trying to get kind of a big picture context rather than diving immediately into the weeds, which we're good at as engineers. <clears throat> And then really look um, at what already existed because it's better to stand on the shoulders of giants than trying to create everything from scratch. So we looked at 12, I think it was 12 um, existing competency frameworks, everything from the NCOSI competency framework, NASA, David mentioned the Helix project. We had a number of things that we looked at and we scanned these existing competency models, ended up with uh, 2000 KSABs, something like that. And we said, which of these are actually relevant to digital engineering? 
Which of these already talk about digital engineering? Spoiler alert, not many. <laughs> there was not much existing at the time. Um, and then how can we tailor what's there and streamline it so that we have a collection that says, here's what's different about what you're already doing if you're doing it in a digital engineering way. And so what we were trying to do again was tease that out, not replicate everything we already had, but highlight the differences, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and then we also had um, interviews and focus sessions with SMEs, um, practitioners, and, and our sponsor as well. And again, Frank was heavily involved in some of that. We had a SME panel that actually reviewed and uh, helped us iterate everything that we did. And we did several iterations and also opened this up uh, for open comment in the community. So fair amount of, of data and review that went into this. <coughs> Excuse me. Did you want to add anything? Um, no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the, I'm sorry. <coughs> Apologies. Um, so this is our mental model that we used uh, to think about the space of digital engineering, and as it should, we should start with data, right? What is it that we have to understand about data? There are things we have to be able to do with it. We have to store it. We have to communicate it. We have to understand how we organize it. Um, how we use it and it's implied here though actually I, I should have pulled this out more how do we validate our data how do we make sure that we have good data for what we're trying to accomplish <clears throat> the data feeds into the models then and models here can be everything from you know physics-based models cad models all the way up through system level models system of system models mission level models so all of those are fed by the data and then those models feed the actual digital engineering activities <clears throat> uh, and this can include uh, as i said before both traditional se sorts of activities as well as some of the acquisition activities and all of those things then produce digital artifacts. So we've we've heard several times, you know, digital twin, digital threads, things like that. We produce a lot of digital artifacts in this environment, and there's uh, some competency around what you actually do with those and what you shouldn't do with those and having that judgment. And then finally, there's also programmatic data, as I said, that's going to feed into this. So that's kind of taking it from the upper left to the lower right. And then uh, if you go down underneath, the data is also part of the software that we use to support this. So that might be Cameo. It might be the different tools. You might be integrating Rhapsody, a, a number of other things. Core, of course, being the best. Um, <laughs> But there's going to be a software uh, element to this and also an understanding of what, again, that software can and can't do. And that software and the data come together to really create your digital environment. And so the idea is that if you have all of these things flowing together properly, you'll be able to successfully uh, engineer and deliver systems. <laughs> do you want to add anything? So with that, this is uh, the end result. I know it's a bit of an eye chart. You guys will have these charts posted on the platform so you can see it in more detail. And if you want the, what is it, 130 page report, I'm happy to share that with you as well. But these are the five uh, main competency areas that we developed based on the research. And you might notice they kind of align <laughs> with that previous picture. So we start with data engineering, and that's again, governance and management. How is it that you actually, um, deal with your data appropriately make sure that you have valid data etc modeling and simulation which for this also included data analytics and ai and uh, machine learning uh, we wanted to call those out specifically because even a couple of years ago what that meant in this space and what the implications were was becoming uh, increasingly important <clears throat> The third group being digital engineering and analysis. And again, that's the systems -y stuff, the good system stuff that we do, uh, doing all of that in a more digital way, as well as doing the management of the engineering activities in that digital space. The system software I mentioned. And some of this is actually understanding a little bit more about software. So I won't make you do a show of hands, but I will say I know a lot of systems folks who, if you say they have to deal with software, break out and do a little bit of a sweat. Um, that's not really going to work going forward. We have to understand at least some basics of software engineering and construction in order to really play actively in this environment. Doesn't mean you have to be able to build a script in Python. Lord knows I I can't do that, but you have to understand some basic rules of construction. 
Uh, and then finally, the digital enterprise environment. And I know that this is a big challenge throughout the department, um, you know, from the individual PEOs through the services and all the way up at the department level, is what does it actually mean for us to have this environment? And then in this context, it's really, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, we broke it down into how, we, how do we develop this kind of environment? How do we manage it and support it? Um, and we specifically called out security because again, there are a lot of illities, right, associated with something like this, but security, the more people we talk to, the more SMEs and reviews we got. The questions of how do we manage the security of this kind of environment as we're transitioning uh, was really uh, at the forefront. So those are the kind of main areas. We um, also had some foundational competencies. <laughs> yeah, I can speak about that. So we also wanted to make sure everyone has a basic understanding. So you have that common ground and benchmark where um, we listed six skills. I know you may think some may be soft skills with coaching and mentoring, but that's also a key piece um, in the competency for a digital engineer. And just to be able to have that um, value proposition to understand the, you know, the importance of it, how can you champion it? Um, and how can you support that? Obviously, we are in the DoD world, so understanding a lot of the policy and guidance and a lot of things that are changing, as one of the keynotes mentioned earlier, we're moving from um, the strategy to implementation. So how can we help you know, guide that by hiring and developing the workforce that's competent in all these areas? Um, this is just, again, a high level view. There are more competencies which we'll describe later. Um, obviously, as Nicole mentioned earlier too, the software part is also key. So just understanding basic code, um, reading comments, you know, and decision making, that's also a key part. How can you take the data, visualize it, or analyze, visualize, and then you make decisions, right? How can you present this to the top leaders to be able to make uh, proper decisions? So these are some that we have considered as foundational. So while they are not listed as competencies, um, directly within the, the, the DECAF. These are the digital uh, competencies, foundational skills that are required. So we also have different proficiency levels and we have defined them you know, from zero to five expert in the domain. So we have um, broken down the competencies by um, those categories. So if you'll see there are different, you know, from basic, just um, understanding some of the general knowledge to experts, right? So these are the SMEs um, who may have many, many years of experience operational you know understanding of the problems so uh, we wanted to make sure we break that down and help mature the competencies of our engineers as they move forward um, as nicole mentioned we had that over 2000 and from that we have scaled down we have over 900 ksabs that we've identified for the five uh, key competency groups and based on those we have outlined at detailed um, competencies for each of these sub competencies and with that you know we broke it down as well um, in the awareness basic intermediate advanced and expert as you can see you know it's it varies between all the different proficiency levels but all these are key so if you know you're going into a team and you realize there is a gap in system software guess what these are you know some of the competencies that you need to look for when you're looking to hire anything else you want to add from this one okay do you want to sure yeah thank you no problem so uh, we mentioned when we talked through our, our systemogram, our little bubble chart, that uh, things like the digital artifacts, digital twin, digital thread were going to be very important. You might have noticed that they didn't actually, those words didn't appear on the last couple of slides. And that's because we believe that they should be woven in throughout. So it's, we don't have a competency called digital thread because aspects of dealing with the digital thread are woven throughout the entire competency model. And so this is just an example uh, of where you're going to find uh, those types of competencies. So they're there, but they're not called out in the way you might have expected because we thought it made more sense to actually show where they aligned across the entire spectrum. <clears throat> So um, in, in another task, we've coined the term eating our own cooking because I don't know, some, for some reason you guys like to say eating your own dog food and I think that's gross. So we ate our own cooking and we uh, actually created a model in Cameo, a system uh, model of this uh, competency framework. So we used that um, 
as we were going through and doing some of this. So some of the things that uh, Yan mentioned, you know, started with over 2,000 competencies. We narrowed it down. Some of that is because we were able to model and see, ah, okay, these are the things that are all related. Are they actually different enough? You remember they came from multiple sources or can we combine them into one? And so having that modeling environment actually be how we built this competency framework was really helpful for that. Um, we do have the Cameo models. If you want them, send me an email. I'll send them over to you or send you a GitHub link and you can actually play with it on your own. Um, just really quickly, the, the final aspect we had of this task was to look at some existing um, courses at the time. So again, this was, um, I think, two years ago, some existing courses and say, well, how do they map against um, the digital engineering competency framework? And so one uh, was a DAU course at the time uh, on uh, modeling simula simulation analysis, and then one was a Coursera course on MBSE. And you can just see really quickly, again, this is output from our model. Um, we captured all of the KSABs that were identified uh, in those courses and then compared them to the DECF to see what the coverage was. And so you can see uh, for things like the, the DAU course at the time, digital engineering and analysis covered about 10% of, of uh, excuse me, the course covered um, about 10% of the total KSABs, but quite a few of the ones in digital engineering and analysis, less on data engineering because that wasn't the focus of the course. <clears throat> and so these tables are just for you to quickly see what that looked like. And then because we were looking from a particular framework, right, model was built for a particular purpose, there were also um, learning objectives and KSABs that were captured in those courses that weren't part of the DECF. Some of those were things like the foundational competencies that Yan mentioned. So um, we will have a couple of uh, other presentations. There'll be one after the break, and uh, Mr. David Pearson is our sponsor for that from DAU. But there are a number of other uh, DAU courses that are currently in development, so a little teaser for that. But I know DAU is working really hard. They've got some DE foundational courses, as well as working on the digital engineering credentials. So if you want to learn more, stay, hang out with us, and uh, come after the break. Anything else from that? Yeah, I just also wanted to say that the DECAF has actually helped to feed a little bit of the future research or the current research that we have been doing. So it's really neat to see, you know, from fruition, right, just the competencies that have been useful to help us um, with the next courses that we're helping to develop with DAU. So yeah, definitely stay tuned. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Sandy Neville Nevair. Um, just with regard to your comment about DAU courses and the credential, we're also working with them across the Navy and, and Air Force and stuff. So we don't want to recreate any classes that you guys are already doing. We want to give up the classes we've already created into the mix so that we can all look at it together so that because you're just going to conferences and finding, oh, we're creating a similar class. So, right. so it's cool to know you guys are in the mix and we'll continue to share. Absolutely, yes. I, I think that was probably music to Dave's ears. We love to collaborate and, and see what's going on everywhere else. So thank you for that, Sandy. Oh, Frank. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Have you thought about using the DECF to, uh, I guess, maybe characterize the the digital engineering boot camp course that you guys have built? Yeah, so so just for context, uh, Dr. Mark Blackburn, who who did some presentations earlier in this track, um, has developed a f kind of a five day DE boot camp. It's very intensive, lots of opportunities to apply. Um, learning on models as part of that and and we actually did so we've worked with mark to look at kind of what the coverage is and and where that aligns across and um, as part of the next presentation again if you want to stay um, we have actually included the decaf in our modeling environment for that project so that we know what links back to the decaf as we're looking at how um, courses and credentials develop so i don't know if that answered your question but <laughs> So we are we are trying to use it wherever appropriate. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> so my question is, uh, 
this is great for seeing how the DECF is informing the DAU and potentially even in the boot camp. But and, and this is great for educating existing workforce. Is there a path for transitioning this into what goes on in updating curriculum at the colleges and universities, thinking that at least we should have that path at the UARC schools that have programs that could be applicable and could be actually updating their curriculum utilizing this, but certainly there are many more programs than that as well. It yeah. seems like that would be something that would benefit the sponsors as well as the UARCs. Is there a plan or path or how could we get that going? Is there a systematic plan? Not at the moment. Uh, anecdotally, we do know some programs that have used both the DECF, uh, there's a mission engineering competency framework and Helix, which is the systems engineering competency framework. And we know from professors that they have used those to inform and update their courses. There is not currently a systematic effort, uh, but again, we do have anecdotes of people saying, oh, we really should be changing the way we're teaching this. And so he's not in the room, so I can mention him. So uh, Dr. Dinesh Verma, who's our director, uh, is teaching an architecture course, and he's actually created um, with some graduate students a, a longitudinal over time buildup of what architecture looks like in a digital environment and how that's going to change over time. And so it it is trickling, not maybe as quickly as we would like, um, but I think uh, I'm currently working on taking um, the mission engineering competency framework helix and this one and creating sort of a master so it sort of says if, if this is the flavor of what you're doing in systems engineering here's what that might look like and what your profile might be so i'm hoping that that will help going forward, but right now it's just anecdotal it's happening just slowly. Thanks. So. <laughs> just wanted to add, we also have oh, yeah. a researcher recently contact us from Israel. So this is going international um, that might be interested in some of the efforts that we're doing with the DECAF as well as the 1043 research because they, ha they are struggling with trying to get a grasp of digital engineering and to have that collaboration, which we have with CERC, you know, in the different universities working on these courses and developing the uh, defense industry. So that's yeah, a great point. I honestly had forgotten, but yes, you're right. That's good. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm stealing no, it back. You just take the mic from Frank. <laughs> I promised I'd give it right back. Uh, I think part of this is also for me saying so from from somebody who's got a foot in academia, but a foot, mm -hmm. maybe more than a foot, maybe like three quarters of the body in industry. <laughs> um, it, colleges and universities are asking industry, what do you need us to teach them? Yes. And then and, and that's where this is also coming from. There's this sure. push pull, but but there's nobody you know, giving them the rope that's doing this connection. So. And, and not with this particular framework with Helix, we have actually worked with companies to pre create profiles to say, okay, this is the kind of person I'm looking for and have very particular language to be able to describe that, which then the universities that tend to service that organization take and say, oh, if we're not teaching this, we'd better you know, add that to the curriculum. So again, not systematically, but we have got a few examples. Frank. <laughs> All right. Um, you know how we, uh, you know how the system engineering competency framework is kind of institutionalized, or it's at least owned now by an organization, a bigger organization, a professional organization. <laughs> is there any plan to maybe do that with the digital engineering competency framework so that it lives and, and can grow? You know, I, I got to believe that we're learning, and so we couldn't have all of it correct. We probably sure. need to update it, but mm -hmm. maybe it doesn't require research, just needs to be fed back from practice. Yeah, and we have provided briefings on the DECF to several groups at professional organizations, uh, particularly, you know, competency working group kind of things. So I, I hope to see some of that going forward. Um, Again, we just we try and stay engaged and do briefings like this so that there's awareness and then whenever people reach out, we sit down and kind of help them work through it. So uh, there's no formal plan at the moment, but I hope to see some of that. Yes, sir. Um, thank you very much. This was very interesting. Uh, my question might be a little bit out of context, but I would like to hear your insight on how we can move <laughs> forward in different application areas. So one of the areas where I think digital tuning and trading will have a lot of value is operation of socio-technical systems, such as systems that make safety critical decisions on a daily basis. This might be air traffic control, radar drone operations, healthcare systems, et cetera. So 
through this effort, what are some of the insights that you gained in terms of being able to extend this digital engineering methods and practice into modeling this human system interaction in an effective way? I'm so tempted to just throw that over to you, but that's okay. Um, so I will be honest, because we were in a lot of ways building off of what already existed and a lot of the existing competency frameworks didn't address that terribly well, we are light on that right now. I agree with you that I think that there's a lot of potential there. Um, it would probably take an update for us to think through the right way to do that. Now we do, again, go across the whole life cycle. So there are some things about kind of you know, being in operation and maintenance phase and that, that sort of thing. But I don't think that we touched that in the way that you mentioned, but it would be interesting for us to have a sidebar about what that might look like, because I'm always interested in updating and making it better. That would be good. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I, I also thought it was out of scope, but I was interested in hearing <laughs> if you... you know. eh, out of scope two years ago, in scope today. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll go ahead and ask a question. <clears throat> Actually, two. So if you think about this, if you think about the current workforce in the context of DECA, what do you see as low-hanging, valuable fruit where we could make a quick win in helping workforce forward? And where do you see kind of that real critical deficiency that's going to take more of an uphill slog? Do you want to start or you want me to? No, you go. Okay. <laughs> um, this feels like a cop-out answer, but it's not intended to be. I actually think a lot of the foundational things that Yan talked through are the low-hanging fruit but also have a big payoff because the, the entire workforce is hearing this is a thing, we're doing this digital transformation thing, but they don't even know what that means for the most part. And so getting clear and concise value propositions around that, that people can understand that don't use the word systems engineering, you know, plain language, so that people can internalize the value proposition is in some ways low hanging fruit, but I think would have huge dividends because once people understand what this really can do for them, they're more likely to embrace it and follow the training. Um, I, I think areas where we're going to particularly struggle, um, data, I, I, we've talked about data a lot here, but I think in general, if you talk data and software to most people who are in kind of the non-engineering side of acquisition, those are terms that are nebulous and uncomfortable. And so I think getting the whole acquisition workforce able to really embrace those things and understand what they mean is going to be a, an uphill battle. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that was your two? All was two. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, you go. Other questions? Danilo here from actually Roche Diagnostics, so I'm on the minority here. I'm not the DOD, right? There's <laughs> very little representation. So when you do of courses like that, do you consider other industries as well? Like I have a lot of friends throughout a lot of different industries, not DOD, right? We're yes. Clamoring from the same skills in a very yep. different context, but pretty much close your eyes the same, right? Do yes. you consider other industries as well? Because I, I see just DOD being consideration, a lot of those things, right? Or I could be wrong. Yeah, so, so I, obviously we had a DOD customer, right? Um, but we, as I said, we worked with professional organizations, we talked with people in industry. So we had a lot of inputs to this that were not DOD specific. So the hope is that it is more generalizable, that it's not too DOD specific. And, and it sounds like maybe we at least got on that road. So that's a good thing. Uh, but yeah, I, I again, welcome any feedback that will help us improvement and make it improve this and make it more applicable um, outside of the department as well. Yeah, and as we mentioned earlier, we looked at the 12 competencies. Again, they're not just DOD related ones, you know, like INCOSI is the whole community of systems engineers. Um, so we have looked at that as well. Anything else? Very good. Thank oh. you both. Oh, oh. We have one more. Ah. <laughs> Last one. Uh, I, uh, thanks for, for a great talk and this is, uh, I think this is very much uh, applicable also in other industries than just uh, DOD. Uh, I can tell from my background. What I noticed is in your systemograms, you start at the uh, at the left right uh, uh, left top um, uh, with uh, with data. Mm -hmm. um, does that include in your vision also knowledge? And let's say that's such a good question. Uh, 
yeah. the available knowledge with with the uh, with the uh, with the engineers and the experts. That's an excellent question. And if you think of the framework, you know, data information, understanding, you know, yeah. knowledge, wisdom. Um, I think it could, but I'm not sure that it does right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to get to the point where we talk more than just data, but I think, as we said earlier, that is such a challenge in so many places that we have to hammer that very hard right now so that when we have that foundation, then we can build up. But ideally, you know, if you have a robust, um, you know, modeling ecosystem or digital engineering ecosystem, it should also have a knowledge management function, right? It should be helping you with that. Um, I don't know if you, you got to attend some of the earlier talks, but Dr. Mark Blackburn was talking about Skyzer and part of what that does is it captures the decisions and the rationale that went into it. So it's not just here's the state, it's here's how we got here. And I think a lot of that's very valuable. Thank you. Yeah, great question to end on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.